You'll never find him. <laughs> He's dead. He's not dead. There's some place in this house. This is the emergency podcast system. This is not a test. Movies are bombing all over the country. They are posing as movies you already know. They may already be in your theaters, your neighbor's home, or even your own. Do not panic. Specialists have been dispatched. They will help you identify these pretenders and defend you against this invasion of the remake. Please stand by for further instructions. Welcome to the Invasion of the Remake podcast. I am your host, Jason Bishop. And today we, uh, we're we ending the month of November with House. Because Sam Stepanenko recently moved into a new home. And I just felt it was appropriate to celebrate his moving with probably the nastiest house <laughs> that you could find. Uh, in House 1986. I guess there's a lot of movies called House. Because <laughs> trying to go through IMDb, it was much easier to put 1986 to thin out the herd. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, so it's hard to find, the, find this movie online. Because there are so many movies that reference house or houses or... Anything like that. Yeah, yeah, and, IMDb and, and, and the same thing with Wikipedia. I was like, ah! <laughs> yeah. And I will say that our new house is nowhere near the nightmare that this house is in the movie. It's got its own quirks and nightmares, but nothing like this one. <laughs> nowhere near as disturbing. House 1986, director Steve Miner. This was the first of a franchise with three sequels. Most I didn't honestly. I was kind of unaware of the the last two, but Steve Miner you might know as the director of Lake Placid, Halloween H two O, and uh, Friday Thirteenth Part Two. Now that link to Friday Thirteenth links back to producer Sean S Cunningham from the Friday Thirteenth franchise, and of course the House franchise. Budgeted at three million dollars, grossing just shy of twenty million in the U.S. alone. It obviously didn't get too far in the worldwide market at twenty-two point one worldwide gross, but that's still great on a three million dollar budget. That's Which why there were about the three sequels. Yes, that's right. That's why there's three more, even though I didn't really know about the last two i kind of knew about four but three's three's the toughie because i don't think it was generally released under the house name i'm not sure i didn't later do the, re- the the research but but yeah uh, well, it, three's we, got lance henriksen so now i want to see it oh yeah and I, I, interesting fact about the first two is the first one has george went mm-hmm. the second one has john ratzenberger Oh, nice! The yeah. Cheers guys. Yeah. So, so yeah, and I, I do remember that. That's just something that I actually remember from watching the first two because I really enjoyed these when I was younger. Yeah, I didn't hate them. Hate house watching it again to, for the show. I actually kind of enjoyed it. I did it as well because I, as much like you, I loved it as a kid. And going back into, I was like, I wonder what this is actually rated. Because that kind of played into my remake a bit. I'm like, well, I can either go like that gory route or i I could kind of keep it the way it is and of course this is a remake episode so i have to think about those sort of things yes (laughs) and uh so i went back to look at the movie poster and it says r on it and i guess maybe because of the scary nature of it but there's no swearing there's no nudity or anything like that there's not even really any blood no it's just the monsters and i mean yeah I, i do have to say they were incredibly well done given the time they were actually a lot of fun to see. Like they were, they were very practical effects, but they worked. Yeah, for a dark house, I guess that it it didn't did it really have ghosts? I guess it had no, one. I, this 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 plays into my remake a little bit because it's not a haunted house. Yeah, it's a portal. Well, yeah, it's definitely a portal into yeah. other planes, but yeah. the ghost of Aunt Elizabeth is is there. I yeah. guess so. There's at least one ghost, but you she only plays like once, and yes. then you never see her I, again. Yeah, and that's that's true. I mean, there, there maybe, is some haunted to it, but it's more. Yeah. It seems more of like to me like as a portal to another realm. Yeah, but even the big bad at the end of the movie is, I guess, technically a ghost. Yeah, right. Because but a portal from the other side. It, it's kind of weird because it's not like he was haunting the house. He's brought to the house 
by, I guess, the memories. Uh, it, it, it's weird. You can got, it make some interpretations. He's brought to the house by the memories of Vietnam, of Roger Cobb, and he couldn't actually write this book that he wants to do about his experiences in Vietnam. I guess he's like a Stephen King horror writer. Yeah. And uh, he's he can't seem to write where he is, so he goes to the house where his aunt recently passed, and, and everything comes flooding back. And his son disappeared. He's got a lot of past with this house, and I can see why he wouldn't want to go back, but at the same time, he's drawn to it. Exactly, yeah. There's, there's, there is this sort of trepidation about going back, but at the same time, it seems like it's necessary for him. Yeah. Right? Like, he has no choice in the matter. Yeah, it might be closure or something, but yeah. there's just something unsaid that's drawing him back to the house. Yeah, and it is where he grew up yeah. after his parents passed away, right? So, so yeah, I mean, I think there's this sort of mix of fond memories and, and then some pretty horrible memories as well. Yeah. Right? And, I mean, the disappearance of his son is very key to the whole movie because it breaks his relationship with his wife, his movie yeah. star wife. And, of course, he's, he's, he's dealing with the trauma of losing his child and now losing his wife and now his aunt. Plus writer's block. So he, the poor guy is pretty fucked up. Yeah. I'm surprised he's not more aware of the weirdness of this house because his aunt sure was if he grew up in it. And there seems to be a history beforehand. And I've, that was one of my, my picky points about the movie in, in rewatching it is the fact that it was missing. That, that key detail is, is why did he not have any of the experiences that his aunt has? until mm-hmm. later because in the movie just what everybody goes in the house has an experience now yeah right but i know why i figured it out just now okay right? because he, did he, anybody hear the the bing <laughs> there, there was one in my head his experiences don't start until after his vietnam experiences because of who the big bad is right because the big mm-hmm. bad is somebody that he knew in Viet- vietnam yes right so that's the trigger i think and he wasn't living in the house after that, he was an adult and married and living on his own. And so I think that may be why his experiences, are this, he's having more experiences and the experiences are more active because there's somebody actively trying to get to him now. It seems like everything starts with his post-Vietnam experiences and going back to the house with his Hollywood wife and, and child. Yes. So, and that's where things kind of begin. Now, this movie stars William Katz. Uh, Kay Lenz, George Went, Richard Mole, Mary Staven. Oh my God, she was hot. <laughs> she was okay. It's a lot of 80s stars, but I'm like, as a kid, I, I think I was just really enamored by that accent. It's She looks great coming out of that pool, but when you see her hair dry and it's all poofy, and I'm like, oh, 80s. Yeah, there, there are a lot of ooh, 80s moments in this movie, actually. <laughs> That's right. And uh, yeah, Su- Susan French. I think I love this movie because it's so fucking crazy. It really is. I, it, I when rewatching it now as as an adult and approaching middle age, it's still fucking nuts. But I, I start making connections. I'm like, okay, this is probably post Evil Dad, and there's uh, definitely a comparison to the yeah, the dead movies in this. Um, Poltergeist, some of that, yeah, and the Vietnam stuff kind of feels like Twilight Zone the movie. Also, some, yeah, some of that stuff. A there. Connection to that, yeah, yeah. So, and it, it's Sean S. Cunningham, and he's kind of known for making franchises of other people's ideas. <laughs> yeah, this is one is definitely a mishmash of, of of other great films. Sure, but it stands alone as well. I, I mean, it, that's the best part about this movie is he managed to take somebody else's ideas and, and kind of convert them into something that is somewhat unique. Yeah. Um, at least at the time. Yeah. And that's kind of something I like about this franchise. It's an anthology franchise. Like, number two doesn't have the same cast, number three, etc. Like, they are different houses with different experiences with different people. So, it's it's a very unique franchise in that regard. Yeah, it's it's more about the, yeah, the, the, the experience of the house rather than the specific house. Yeah. 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 I guess Amityville, too. I mean... It would have been post Amityville, so it would have been, yeah. And I guess there, would but it have feels been, more like Poltergeist to me. It, it, it does, yeah, because it's, it's the cartooniness of it. Yeah, the cartooniness of it, and and the difference in the malevolent nature of the the, the whatever it is that's, that's occupying the house. Yeah, I don't want to say haunting because that really doesn't seem like a haunting to me in this movie. It's, no, it feels like a house built on top of a pit of hell. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's 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 an occupation. Right? Yeah, they, they, they've they've taken over. They're they're taking over. Um, yeah. 
yeah so so yeah no it's it, it, it was a fun fun watch yeah i do recommend this if i think it it's kind of fallen in the wayside as a forgotten horror comedy classic it was more known as in my childhood like i would talk in, in the schoolyard with other kids about this movie and we all kind of loved it but as they got older this franchise kind of went away and, and we talked about it so it, it kind of missed the cult status thing it, ju- it just just a little bit yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there, it, when you mention it to people of our generation they're like oh yeah house that was a great movie but they don't think about it no when you and trish mentioned it to me i'm like oh yeah let's do that right because it's a. It was. It was a fond, fond memory. Yeah, and poor Trish is in here today, yeah. so she's going to miss out. She was really excited to do this one too. Yeah, but it was. It, it, and you know, I think part of it was the poster. That that, that I mean that that image is iconic to me. Oh of yeah, the disembodied of hand ringing pushing the, the doorbell. doorbell. Loved it. Yeah, and we're talking like a desiccated kind of like zombie like hand. Yeah, it's. It was brilliant. It was brilliant marketing when you were to think about yeah. it. It was so simple. Yeah. Right, and it was. It was just graphic enough to draw you in it's like oh this could look like it could be fun and sure enough it was although we never did get the disembodied hand yes we did, we did. oh we did too yes sorry. yes but let's run the trailer and and then we'll talk more about disembodied hands this is a house where no one should live lived here before you was nuts wouldn't be surprised if someone just got fed up in Austria she was my aunt heart of gold though Roger Cobb has come here alone daddy (laughs) but no one is ever alone in the house this house knows everything about you It has been waiting for him. Hi. Sandy. Now. It wants you. Horror has found a new home. I love that 80s narrator guy. I don't know. He had the best voice. I know. That's funny. His, he came up during my research for this movie, just looking for casting and stuff like that, because I was looking for actors with very specific sounding voices. Unfortunately, he's now passed, and, well, he yeah. would have been too old for this movie anyhow, but, and I can't remember his name, unfortunately, but, but, but yeah, I know who you're talking about. He had a great voice for trailers. Oh, yeah. He was, he was like, the best trailer guy, because they put him on a lot of horror movies. And... They put him on just about everything. Anything that really needed a really dramatic tone yeah they use that guy right and i mean it's that's great i think that's awesome that you can make that you should be able to make a career out of doing voiceovers for movie trailers now you can't do that so much well i'm sure there i'm sure there are but it's it's uh it's one of those careers that about only four or five guys get to do that's true yeah. and and the way they cut trailers now a lot of the times they don't use narration so but you know those voiceover guys they they're just careers in other places and now you're seeing it on screen junkies plug uh, even though we're not there yes <laughs> and uh, they do those kind of critique trailers yeah yeah so you know those guys get work still yeah oh yeah there's lots of lots still lots of voiceover work but it's yep. just the, the, you're not getting the the, the the movie trailer as a career no i kind of miss that classic trailer thing but I guess it's one of those things you roll out when it's uh, something a little more retro. Yeah, something that's a little inspired by it. Which brings me to something that I wanted to mention about this movie. Is for anybody who's at all social aware of uh, right now, uh, Stranger Things is like this hot, hot item on, on Netflix. And they're in the process of doing season two. Really? You've never mentioned it. Tell me about it. Uh, <laughs> shut up. Um, <laughs> This isn't for you. This is for them. Um, <laughs> asshole. Um, <laughs> He's only mentioned it like a dozen times. On I've the only show. actually mentioned it twice. This will be I think, the third time. There's a reason I'm mentioning it because well, between you and Trish, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and me since I've seen it now. Yeah, I guess. it's 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 a great homage to the to, to the 80s, and I can see House influences in Stranger Things having watched House again. 
yeah, that does play later. Yes, I, and and it, it was it, like after I watched it, I'm going, hmm, this has already to a certain extent been remade in Stranger Things because yeah. there's a lot of this movie in that in in that series. Yeah, and it's one of those movies of a, probably a group of things from that generation that really inspired the Duffers to do that and it was the first thing that popped in my head watching this as well it's like this is really part of that whatever inspired them for sure yeah there's no question the the the, 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 uh, portals and the disappearance of the child and there's a lot happening there that just you can tell that they 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 have a reverence for this movie as well yeah and being of that generation i kind of wanted to keep this movie in the 80s. Oh, for sure, yes. It's certainly not necessary to. There's no reason why you couldn't bump the Vietnam conceit up to whatever, you know, to uh, operation. Iraq or Afghanistan yeah. or whatever, yeah. Yeah, you know, there's that's fine, and it's not like the advent of computers and cell phones and, oh my God, his old computer. <laughs> yes, it was so much fun to see, actually. Yeah. That tiny little screen. Yeah, it was awesome. So it, it wouldn't change anything to modernize it, but just... I don't know. There's something about that retro 80s feel that I kind of wanted to keep. I'd agree with you on that one. There's nothing saying that when we do a remake that it has to be modernized. Yeah, and um, this is kind of one I want to keep there. Yeah, I didn't really think, it th- think, think of that. I was thinking more modernization, but as, as we're talking about it, yeah, certainly keeping it in, in, set in, in that mm-hmm. late 80s era adds a certain feel to it. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, I was really torn when I was thinking about it, too. Do I want to kind of keep it horror comedy, or do I want to go that Evil Dead remake route and yeah. really just make it a splatter gore fest? And as I'm nodding my head, so you, which you guys can't hear. Yeah. Um, but I was of the same mind. I'm like, do I just really go a balls-out horror with this, or do I keep it sort of in that horror yeah. comedy vein? And this one's just barely a horror comedy. There isn't a lot of comedy. Well, and that's, I think... Maybe why this doesn't stick out as a cult classic because the comedy doesn't land as well as it should. That's right. Yeah, it's. it's I mean, George went. It really was intended as a comedic relief, and he played those moments. But, but it kind of comes off annoying. It's just that annoying neighbor, the, nosy neighbor, the, the annoying needy neighbor who's looking for a friend, which can work. But it just. I thought he was the shitty neighbor. He invites himself over. Granted, he brings beer and pizza, which is kind of cool. and Or beer and Chinese, I should say. And then <laughs> steals poor Roger's phone book because he thinks something's up with Roger. Which I think is great. I actually really enjoyed that that aspect. It's like this guy who barely knows him. Part of me thought he was just stalking his, his ex-wife. <laughs> the, the, the movie star wife. The, the, well, there, there was a little bit of that feel. But the way that particular interaction was handled, it was more the compassionate neighbor. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. it was. Um, at first, you kind of get that creepy feeling. Right? I think I would have uh, kept him a little more on the border. <laughs> yeah, given it a little, a little more of a creepy thing because he was a fanboy, right? Yeah, I and mean, he was definitely a fanboy. He has this like literally. Uh, I appreciate a well-read book, but this one's falling apart. Yeah, it, it literally did fall apart. apart. <laughs> it, yeah, it fell apart when he pulled it out of his back pocket and he wanted it signed, which I kind of appreciated. He could have, uh, he could have easily just gotten a probably a brand new copy from the author and, yeah. and signed, but he wanted that one signed that because he loved it was his so well-loved much. Copy, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And this, and this is actually speaks to why it would be a good reason to keep it in the eighties because you don't get that same writer. That's true. Adoration. The writer's going to sign your iPad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, people do still buy your books. Kobo. Thank goodness. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that you, but you don't get that sort that same adoration and, and, infatuation with a writer that you used to right yeah. i mean you don't have writers with this yeah 80s was really a writers they were kind of superstars i mean the, i don't know if we'll ever see a writer be stephen king or clive barker again no you know from from that era i mean we certainly got a lot of great writers out there now um in in the ya genre and they're getting a lot of movies out there and with uh, patterson and whatnot but yeah at the same time, I, you know, do I think they're the same level? I don't know. They're, it's they're a, just, a very different kind of stardom. Yeah, right? it's I mean, not the same anymore. You look, you look at yeah, Stephanie Myers or J.K. Rowling, and... J.K. is probably the one that maybe broke that barrier. She did, but, it, but I mean, she became a media sensation because of, because of the way she, she came up from... And, and mm. the startling success of that first book, mm-hmm. right? And now she now she's turned into a an enterprise. Yeah, she's it's a, created an entire empire. Yeah, and it, unlike someone like Stephen King or Clive Barker, where mm-hmm. 
they're each book stood alone on its own merits. Right. I mean, aside from the Dark Tower, Steve, Stephen King's created a whole world. I mean, and Dark Tower yeah. fits into that in, uh, to, into a large extent, but yeah. he created a whole world based around that. His yeah, main J.K. J. Rowling kind of fell into the well. You hit right away, and now that's all anybody wants to read. That's right. They yes. want to be in that world all the time. That's right. They, they, she, she's she's a, a very much a, a Which one is world. Probably artist. frustrating for her if she ever wanted to write something else. Well, she did write a detective novel under under a pseudonym, and mm-hmm. it, it apparently did it was it was quite good. But the the secret was revealed before the book even came out, so it kind of defeated the purpose of right. seeing if her if she was a writer or if she was just a really fortunate act of of god i guess that she came up with these with this great these great characters in this great world but again the reviews on the book itself were fair to middling so this it does show that she's capable of writing other stuff Mm -hmm. but nobody's going to give her a chance yeah and that that that's you know that that kind of success is is great you're going to live off it forever but at the same time it's a bit uh, suppresses the creativity to, if it wants to go elsewhere. And I mean, thankfully she's got a world where she can kind of do whatever she wants in it and change the genre and still be in that world that makes the Harry Potter people happy. As she's doing with Fantastic Beasts. Exactly. And uh, my brother just saw it recently and uh, was raving about it. So Yeah, I, I will watch it, although I was not in love with the Harry Potter movies. I loved the books, but I didn't like the movies. Well... I feel, I, and I still feel, I'm too old for the books. So I've never read the books. I don't care to read the books. Yeah, I think it was around the second or third movie where I kind of bought into the franchise as a film franchise and really started really liking the world. God knows that first movie pisses me off. Touch of death. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I just hate that. It was such a cheat. <laughs> yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. <laughs> But we're not talking about Harry yeah, Potter. Yeah, we're, we're not. I'm sorry, we got sidetracked we by are. writers again. As usual, we get sidetracked, but that's what we do. <laughs> but yes, back to Roger Cobb. Back to Rat. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about Harold and, and his obsession. Actually, going back to uh, earlier in the film before he moves into the house... I liked when he was doing the signing and he just had this lineup of really strange 80s oh, that was stereotypes. So much fun. <laughs> and I kept thinking about it. I'm like, I wish I had time to cast the entire lineup. Oh, yeah. Because I was thinking about that. I'm like, I want to cast everybody in that line <laughs> as, be, as, as just Easter eggs. Yeah. And it, it would be fun if like a lot of them were like really big celebrities, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, one of them's got to be Stanley because. That's me. That's a comic. I'm a comic guy, so yeah. I want Stanley in that line. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I mean, it would be just fun to see, see some some of these lesser, well, not lesser known, but but lesser used celebrities like a Steve Buscemi or. Well, I would put because it's uh, they're lining up for this, you know, a movie author's. The, 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 in the movie, he's an author, but you know, he's a fictional author. I would actually put actual authors. That'd be even better, like Stephen line. King and yeah. Clive, and or you know, yeah. Joe. Joe, that would actually would be great to have Stephen King and, and Joe Hill in line because yes. Joe Hill just looks like Stephen King when he was in his twenties and thirties. Yes, <laughs> he just he looks like a younger Stephen King, like in every way. Well, <laughs> go figure. Um, but man, some sometimes they don't, people don't look like their parents. <laughs> he just looks like a clone of his dad. Yes, <laughs> and um, he's a hell of a writer too. So he writer, might be. But... He might be. Yeah, he has a very different style of writing, which I really enjoy. That's what I really like about the fact is yes, he went and followed his father's footsteps, but it's very different. Yeah, but we're d- diverging it's writing again. Yeah, that, that's okay. I wanted to I wanted to bring up that lineup because yeah. uh, there's something that I thought was really charming about that scene, yeah. even though it's just a lineup full of eighty well, eighty stereotypes, and I would keep that. But I want recognizable faces in that lineup. That would be fun. You know, yeah. one and there's actually a really great moment in that lineup where he's interacting with these people, and mm-hmm. he, one of these guys asks him what his next book's going to be about, and when he says it's, it's going to be about my personal experiences in Vietnam, the, the 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 reaction that he got was very negative. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying with Rowling and trying to get out of yeah. out of the the Harry Potter world. These people know him as a horror writer, and that's all they want out of him. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And and nobody wanted to read about Vietnam. Oh, Vietnam. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> yeah, and it was still, I mean, in 1986, it was still a sore point because I, I think mm-hmm. that that was about the time that Platoon when it came out and it was, 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 was planning on coming out and it was kind of revolutionary. I mean, aside from Apocalypse Now, people weren't really making movies about Vietnam because mm-hmm. it was a very touchy subject for Americans. Yeah. Right? And to a certain extent still is, but not, but as we, we go past to other touchy Military actions 
for the U.S. Uh, it's yeah. less sensitive than it used to be. I guess in a country where everybody thinks that every decision is is perfect and awesome, to have one that isn't, who knows? Yeah, but yeah it was always. I mean, even at the time, that was a very divisive subject. It was very During, divisive. I mean, yeah. it was before my time, but or kind of within within my childhood. But I was too young to appreciate because I was watching cartoons. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I I only remember it vaguely from interaction because I'm a little bit older. I remember it vaguely some media attention, mostly mostly through my parents um, paying attention to it. Yeah, I honestly don't recall even any media. I just was too young for it. Yeah, William Katz, Roger Cobb. He his aunt passes away. Now this was a, a really fun scene in and of itself too, because this old lady's getting the grocery deliveries to the house uh, because obviously she's, she's i guess she's too old or and she's kind of known as the crazy lady and had been for a while yes. so i'm guessing she, it's not one of those she didn't feel comfortable going out in public or something or maybe, maybe. maybe it could have been the grip of the house itself it keeping her been, from yeah. leaving well and she's old i mean maybe she's just not mobile enough anymore yeah right? so we don't see enough of her but the the kid brings in the groceries sets them down hears a noise goes exploring in the house and it's Aunt Elizabeth hanging from a light in in, in the bedroom. So, so well, she must be fairly mobile because she was mobile enough to hang herself. Yes. So, so I was unsure about the grocery delivery, but whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I, I mean, there's a and it, when she shows up as a as a spirit or a, yeah. a, a warning to to Roger, she does talk about how they tricked her, and I'm not sh- yes sure how they did that. And that would have been interesting to see is like how they how they finally got her because she'd been dealing with these ghosts for thirty forty years. Yeah, she had their number. Yeah, so she, she thought she did. She thought she they did, and she, and she, they must have like. And so I would have been interested to see how like how they. Yeah, her. there's a, a whole story there we didn't get to see, and maybe that should have been a house zero. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like we we should have had a prequel to that movie because yeah. there's a whole story that doesn't get developed there. Yeah, and the challenge is, is, is I mean, most people aren't interested in seeing movies with older women, right? Mm-hmm. Which is unfortunate, because sometimes those are really interesting. Yeah. I mean, imagine watching a horror comedy with Betty White. Like, I'd oh, be all, yeah. all, all fucking over that. <laughs> totally all over that. <laughs> yeah. we have to write that. Um, yeah, we might. We might. So, yeah, that's kind of left unexplained, but that sets up the stuff with the house. And uh, it, Rogers originally wants to sell the house. Now, did you recognize the realtor? I did. Did you know from where? No, I just, it was okay. just bugging me. It, it, yeah, it, uh, I, I, I caught it about midway when they're talking about it, and you can see Rogers trying to. He, I think he's he, he he wants to maybe keep the house. He's getting toured around a house he already knows about. Yeah. But anyway, I, I thought that was weird. But um, I recognize the realtor. He is the hotel manager in Ghostbusters, the oh. first guy to hire the Ghostbusters. That's who it was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think I've seen him in other things as well. Like, I mean, he's he's one of those sort of. I know that guy from somewhere actors, mm-hmm. and I, I know he's he's done other stuff. But yeah, that is this whole movie. Yeah, I know <laughs> this full of like that eighties guy that was in that thing that one time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, and William Cat. I don't know what happened. He was so. He was busy in the eighties. He, he was, was busy a, in the late seventies, early eighties, and right up until the right up until about ninety three, ninety four, I think. He, yeah. was, he was just always working. Maybe yeah. it was those Perry Mason movies. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe he just got himself sort of typecast there, right? Yeah. Well, he's. I was looking it up. He's still working. He just it's Voice just and, not in a lot of things that we see now. Yeah. You know, being in his 60s, but he's still acting. In fact, most people in this movie were are still active. Still active, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just they're, they're not in those big A-list movies. They're doing TV spots, that sort of thing. Yeah. So And voice, a lot of voice. Like, a, lot of voice a lot of voice. Work. Yeah, so it's you, sometimes unaware that they're busy, but yeah. they're still busy. So he's acting in film and doing voice work as well. Yeah, but, but yeah, a lot smaller, smaller roles in, in smaller films, right? Yeah. But yeah, he was hot. And interesting fact about William Katz, not the one we were talking about earlier, but a different one, is... Hey, we didn't par- talk about it on, on air, so... <laughs> yes. Well, and I, I will mention that. We'll, we'll talk about that after, too. But um, in the Perry Mason movies, he's actually acting with his mother. His mother is in all of those as well. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and his first movie role, he, his, he also star- um, starred opposite his mother. 
I can't remember the name of the movie, but but it, it wasn't Carrie, but it was uh, like sm- something smaller. But but yeah, his his mother was is, is a, was a working actress for, um, and was in the original Perry Mason series, and she reprised her role for the. Perry oh, Mason I movies. totally right, remember her yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it's interesting. His, a lot of his career he spent working with his mother, which is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, he he was an actor I always liked. Like he had this interesting look. He was handsome, but there was. An, I don't know. There was a bit of crazy that they do get to do in here. Yeah. And when he gets to cut loose a little bit, it's really fun. But they, it, it seems like there's just something holding was holding him back all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you saw a little more of sort of that, those comedic chops that he's very capable of in mm-hmm. Greatest American Hero, more so That's than right. in this. Because it's unfortunate that Greatest American Hero only got two seasons because it was pretty smart superhero comedy. I love that show. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like right from the first episode, they it, it was just a lot of fun. And this guy who does not know how to be a hero and his growth, right? Yeah, he finds a super suit but loses the instruction book. Yes, I mean it doesn't get better than that, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was. It, so and that's where you really get to see how capable he is at, at comedy as well as drama. Yeah. I well, when that monster comes out of the closet and he sets up all the cameras. Yes. He's ready to go. He's got his military fatigues yeah. on and the helmet. And the goggles. I love the, the goggles. goggles. And I, it was such a weird scene, but he pulls out, open the door and runs like a bat out of hell down the stairs and gets outside and raises his arms. Yeah. And does the knee slide across the porch. Don't yeah. forget the knee slide, knee across, slide the across the porch. Knee slide across the porch. And then there's Harold. Hi. <laughs> and yeah. I, it was such a strange but funny moment. Yes. Yeah. And, that, and that, that's one of the bits of comedy that did work really well. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I kept thinking like a, this looked like it was out of a Tom Cruise movie or something. Yeah. It, 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 and there may have been a certain bit of, the, bit of that in there too because this is post-risky business, I think. Yeah, it would have yeah. been. Yeah. And they really loved – mocking that movie in, in other movies mm-hmm. um, in the late 80s, especially things like the knee slide and the dancing in their tidy whities and stuff like that. They're, you see that in a lot of movies from the late 80s. Yeah, hell, you still see it. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the, setting up all the cameras, and I, I wanted to go back to that because it, it's almost... I, I saw that and I'm going, wow, that's really interesting to see that many cameras. It's almost like it, it was sort of the precursor to the found footage movie that we're getting now because... It, yeah, because I mean, he had so many cameras, which would have might have you know when you think remake and you see that think about that scene, uh, I wouldn't go found footage entirely, but it's something you could put together with with that kind of material. Oh, there's a TV show whose name I can never remember, but they it was done. The TV show was done by the uh, the Blair Witch guys and Freaky Links. Freaky Links. Thank you. I love Freaky Links and. Every now and again, it would cut to some of this footage from from their cameras, and I thought that was a really good device not to do it all the time. Yes, but can you know have a standard narrative and then break to some of the footage stuff? I thought that worked really great, and I'm kind of surprised nobody's kind of done that and then blended the narrative a little bit better. Yeah, and that's a, a, that, that would make the found footage movies a lot more bearable to watch in most cases. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, so I, I had that moment there right, while we were when they was put, setting up all the cameras. I'm like, oh, maybe this is what's responsible for all that found footage stuff that we're getting nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not. But but th- th- there was that that moment of connection we all know it's Blair Witch yes <laughs> yes if there was anything before then then maybe there probably was but Blair Witch is what made it a thing so. because it's one of the few movies that actually did it well as well yeah well it broke rules yeah you know generally even when I was in film school like that that was not something you did yeah like that was a no-no that was something you did in film school and to fuck up yes. <laughs> like never do that again yeah. guess what you fail um, <laughs> yeah i would have too yeah. you're never going to work in this town again <laughs> and those blair witch guys did it and go oh yeah <laughs> i haven't even graduated yet and we have a hundred million dollars fuck you <laughs> exactly i kind of like that i like that a lot well and you know what i think they've proved they I, I, we're off topic a little bit here but they proved that you don't have to follow the rules to make a great film anymore yeah. Right. And you know what the great filmmakers never did? No. They're I mean I watch things like silent films and I'll watch Metropolis and yeah. even now I'll be like, fuck, like 
you know, it looks so good. And like, I can, you know, I'm savvy now, so I kind of know how they did it. But at the same time, like, they didn't know they couldn't do it. Like, yeah. they shouldn't have been able to do it, but they did it. You know, big cityscapes and with things flying across the screen and like this this shouldn't be you shouldn't have been able to do this back then but you did yeah and it's superior to the stuff we were seeing in the 50s yeah right that's that's the mind-boggling bit is like it's like the filmmaking took like four steps back between the 30s and the 50s yeah right now they're making steps forward but again it's it's because of directors that like the the folks who did Blair Witch right saying no fuck the rules there aren't any yeah to think they did it without computers and I mean they were just editing film you know directly on film like that's crazy to even think about what they were doing at the time it was awesome and you know everything's in camera yeah 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 no so so yeah i mean we i mean again off topic but that's okay um no like that, that kind of blends into this too because yeah. there's it's all still practical in here it's very practical some things definitely look dated now a good like there's probably a good portion of this movie the makeup on richard mole when he's the the vietnam vet brought back is kind of the skeletal zombie thing yeah. and you can kind of see into his mouth and yeah. <laughs> you can see kind of the face behind it yeah yeah i mean but for 1986 it was pretty impressive sure right um and certainly as a teenager it's 16 years old i wasn't looking for the flaws i was just immersing uh, you know, myself in I'd, the movie, right? i'd never seen that kind of i never noticed that before yeah and granted that's when we talk about that 80s grain in movies that hides it so when we get these these uh remastered editions and everything's cleaned up it's not always in service of the movie <laughs> no no and this is a really good example of of, of where it, it maybe wasn't such a, a great service to it i mean th- it was still pretty yeah no i don't standard definition yeah but it, was, it was definitely not as grainy as it would have been when yeah. we saw it the first time yeah it's uh, that's one of those get a worn out vhs thing to hide, kind of hide some of that yeah yeah yeah, and that's that's. I, I don't even know if this is even available on DVD. I used to own it on VHS. I was kind of. I I meant to comb Amazon and see. Um, thankfully, I found found an online. You can certainly get it on iTunes and things like that. Um, and and YouTube, um, you can buy it there as well. But generally, they all seem to be standard def that yeah. I've found. So it, it's not a remastered thing. But I can see maybe anchor bay or somebody coming along and and doing that with this movie because because i think people should rediscover the this franchise for sure at least the first two Uh, maybe we're helping right now yeah there we go now we should i guess we should talk a little bit more about the vietnam stuff and considering it's kind of critical to the movie yeah big ben was one of the soldiers in rogers Rogers platoon yeah. yeah and he's one of those soldiers that you never want on your side because <laughs> he's he's violence hungry he doesn't take orders um, he's a little crazy he's a little crazy and he gets his platoon in trouble like despite the fact that he was also the first to notice like there he's making noises he's getting in shit for the noises but he's also the first to hear the the Viet Cong coming up from behind the troop it was so when, a grenade to let hit the ground. no but he he's already aware he's like listening and he's like oh something's going on like his spider sense is tingling yeah. or something and then the grenade and then of course uh, he warns everybody get down as the grenade hits the f- ground but he's already kind of warning people as it's happening yeah yeah no yeah he, he is very aware he, he's one of those good soldiers that really shouldn't be a soldier yeah, he's good at his job when it comes down to it, but boy, he does a lot of things that get everybody else put the rest of the platoon at risk. Yes, he does do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, and he he likes his pranks and and yeah, he's just generally he's just not a very nice person. No, he's a bully and pranking on people in like the worst possible times. Like, really? Now? Now is the time? Yeah. Yeah, you dick. <laughs> Arguing with his commander and it's just he's he's terrible. Well, and I want to talk about Richard Mole in this movie and I, this this realization I had watching this. And my wife and I have been watching Night Court intermittently over the last little while. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, he really isn't a very good actor. No, no, he's really not. Uh, he he got famous based on his presence, the, his size, and that rumbling voice of his. Mm. But 
he's not a good actor. No, when he's playing kind of a cutesy role, uh, like he is in Night Court, that tall, intimidating, but very lovable guy, he was good at that. Yes. I don't think anything, outside of that, I don't think I've ever seen him in, in, in anything that I thought he was very good at. Now, we do talk about Richard Mull in our Sword and the Sorcerer episode, so go check that out. Um, that is episode... I have no idea. Go look. <laughs> yes, we didn't make. Money. It is episode. I have no idea, <laughs> but it, there's a whole bunch of fantasy movies around that time. So, <laughs> yeah, that would have been back in June. Yeah, probably. Yeah, May June. So, yeah, May, again, not not the greatest actor. I remember um, seeing him in. I think he was in the pilot of the Highlander television series, oh. and he was just basically playing a Kurgan ripoff type of character. And he's okay at it, but yeah, it's just. He's just not a good actor. Sorry, Richard. We all love you, but don't love you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, <laughs> Loved you in Night Court, and I just can't seem to like you in anything else. That's pretty much the way I feel about Richard Mole as well. Yeah. Um, he's so much fun to look at, because he does have so much character when you look at him. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and, and that voice, that voice is really impressive. Yeah. And well, you know, he's got that size, so uh, especially under that makeup, it still kind of works. Yes. But yeah, really... As far as his acting skill goes, no, not so much. Yeah, well, I'm kind of wondering about the script. They must have dumbed down the script because his lines are terrible too. And you know, what? maybe we're putting too much on Richard and and not enough on the writers for, for yeah. his character because yeah, the lines were pretty bad, and that's probably part of it. Um, and we can blame the story to Fred Decker of RoboCop Three and Monster Squad fame. Explains a lot. And the screenplay by Ethan Wiley of House Two. So they were just stuck with the same guy. So so. I'm not sure. I mean, I like Monster Squad, but RoboCop 3, ah, that damn near killed that franchise, actually. It did for a little while. Actually, it did kill a franchise until... Well, it was a backdoor pilot to a TV series nobody wanted because nobody wants PG, kid-friendly RoboCop. (laughs) Everybody wants violent, R-rated RoboCop. Yeah, I'll buy that for a dollar. God damn right. <laughs> and I would buy this movie for a dollar. Oh, for sure. Uh, I might even buy it for five or six. Um, That's right. <laughs> that, that, that This is one of those Walmart dives that you yeah. find. It's like, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> this is it's, awesome. Yeah, you, it's like you're finding yeah, that, that jewel that you, you, you didn't even know you were looking for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now, back to the Vietnam stuff, Richard Mole. Uh, we there's another flashback. These are all happened mostly through memory of of Roger. Um, sometimes instigated by events in the house. Sometimes he in, when he's writing. Uh, yeah, typically when he's writing. Although the the major reveal happens when Roger crawls through his bathroom mirror into this weird zone and relives Richard Mull's death or kind of death. He's been severely injured. And wants Roger to put him out of his misery, you know, finish him off. And Roger can't do that. He just he can't he can't force himself to do that and and end his suffering. And Richard is uh, Richard Mull's character of Big Ben is taken by the Viet Cong and tortured for months. So which I'm like the injury couldn't have been that bad if he's been tortured for months. Of course, he claims he was tortured for months. That his the, his undead spirit thing is saying he's been he was tortured for months before for dying so either they were trying to keep him alive while they were torturing him or he wasn't all that injured <laughs> exactly it's one or the other right it, yeah it, um i mean like you, you fucking drama queen yeah <laughs> as, as roger's running away right trying to to flee the, the, the Viet Cong or who are slowly creeping up on them big ben's hollering i'll get you for this Right and, mm. uh, again, not great dialogue. He but. did it again when Roger sticks the grenade in his in, in his rib cage. Yeah. He's like, "I'll get you for this." Not when you're painted in all the walls. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, it, 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 this is the the motivation between behind what's actually happening to Roger in this house. Yeah. Um, ultimately. Um, yeah. As and this is also again it goes back to to when it's really starting to affect Roger is when his son disappears from the house. That's 
I, I'm guessing it's probably one of the, fir- the first times he's been back to the house since he returned from Vietnam, mm-hmm. because that his, his, the disappearance of his son is directly related to the, hap- the goings on at the house. Yeah, the son had disappeared in the pool in the back of the house, and Roger had dive to see if maybe the, the son had was drowning and he's just not in the pool he's just gone that's where that sets up now getting back to the pool in the back of the house yes. <laughs> there's another neighbor across the street who i guess he he sees running at the beginning of the film when he first meets harold the hot girl this is uh, tanya played by mary stavin now later on when he's actually living back in the house he comes in the backyard and there she is in her bathing suit just coming out of the pool and yes. introducing herself like wouldn't you ask the new owner to go swim in the pool before you go swim in the pool and trespass and she she does say that she had an arrangement with her with his aunt but i think that doesn't make the arrangement carry over into the new order, Not necessarily, no. Um, <laughs> that's awfully presumptuous. It is very her. presumptuous. But, but that's her nature. <laughs> yes, it definitely is, and that shows up later as well. But I think the key thing here, too, is he's already had some experiences, and actually he's in the process of burying the body of one of the monsters or demons that live in That's the right. There's this demon that actually presented himself initially as his ex-wife. Yes. Um, and this plays after Harold had called her, so... You know, it does play on the audience a little bit too. Is this her or isn't it? And she drops uh, to pick something up behind a table, so she drops out of the shot for a second and then comes back up with this fat witch thing yeah. uh, that attacks that attacks him. And some great fun and dialogue ensues. And uh, oh, we should go talk about the shed for a minute too. He grabs. He he goes to the shed to grab the shotgun, and then the tools attack them. Uh, and it's actually, there's a lot of paintings on the wall too that foreshadow some of this stuff, yes. including the the flying tools. Um, so he manages to kind of evade them for a moment, trap them in the shed for temporarily. Temporarily, yeah. And then they re re find him back at the house. He's coming to the bathroom. And they're floating there, so he managed to kind of duck under them and then trap them. Yeah, in they're the homing tools. Yeah, they really are. They're homing tools. I'm like, well, if they weren't attacking you, this this might actually be useful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, go hammer that. Go do this. Yeah. Go chop that wood. Um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they do wind up coming to his rescue, kind of in, in unintentionally. Inadver- unintentionally. Yeah. So when he's battling this. Which wife thing? I don't know. I'll call it uh, Sandy Monster. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way of calling it because yeah, it doesn't have a name. So. Yeah, the Sandy Monster, and it's not going too well for him. She gets his gun, and so he opens the door to the bathroom, and the tools come flying out, and the hedge clippers wound up chopping her head off. Yes, awesome scene. Yeah, awesome scene. So he is. I think he'd already just. Was he on in the process of burying? Uh, yeah, he'd already buried the head. That's right, and he was in the process of burying the body. Yeah, he was dragging the body out, and she's in the pool, and she comes out, and he's she's attractive, and he's attracted to her. But he's also very distracted. He's also very distracted by the bag, which doesn't want to stop twitching and moving. And, and, which is so much fun to watch. Yeah, because... so he's trying to kind of flirt with her while at the same time trying to keep it from grabbing her or grabbing him. And, and trying to appear normal because and, it's, it's, yeah. he's burying a body. Yeah, <laughs> and he's, you know, he wants, he's flirting with her, but at the same time trying to get her to the fuck out of there <laughs> like yeah this is not a good time maybe you shouldn't be here right? yeah yeah it's it's a really great sort of subtle comedy happening there it was a lot of fun to watch yeah well and then she has this wry line it's like i can tell when a man needs to work and when a man wants to play and i'm like oh she wants to get down yeah. no no she doesn't <laughs> no, she really doesn't. She uses him as a babysitter. <laughs> without asking. Yeah, without asking. Just plops over her son, brings over her son, and it's like, now I can see you want to play. Here's my son. Here's here's all his things. Uh, I'll be by later tonight. Bye. <laughs> In this house that's actually actively trying to kill him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Not great planning on her part. Yeah. And, and well, and- during that conversation, the son run, actually runs off. And one of the chopped off hands, because he did wind up chopping the body up afterwards and burying them in tiny little holes. But the hand is attached to itself the back, to the yeah, back of the kid. <laughs> that's right. That's where the disembodied hand was. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 No, that was, it, it, another fun scene. 
right. yeah another fun scene and then she just like here's all this stuff and and he does kind of get into parental mode like this is a moment where he's being protective of the kid because he keeps having to protect him yeah. <laughs> but it's funny how he every time he saves him and then they go and do something very normal Yes. For a moment. It's almost like, eh, that didn't happen. It uh, happens a lot in this movie. It does happen a lot in this movie. And I, I think in the case with, with, with where he's with the kid, he's trying to make light of, or, or of, of the experience so that the, mm. it, the kid doesn't say anything about it, doesn't really remember it. It becomes part of a game. So nobody else is going to, to sort of take yeah. it seriously if he talks about what happened in the house. Yeah. Right? No, he's got this innocent child. He's got a... He's been forced to to take care of while mom's off getting laid. Like, what a shitty... Just... Ugh. <laughs> that made me so angry. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Did you use everybody in the neighborhood like this? <laughs> yeah. She's, she she becomes, goes from being sort of intriguing to really unlikable really fast. Real fast. Yeah. I don't know what she's actually off doing, but seriously. <laughs> well, she's dressed for a night out. So yeah, she's she, totally. Yeah. So she's definitely not... Going to play cards with her girlfriends. That's, for sure. <laughs> That's not the thing that happens. <laughs> not when you're wearing gold lame with a cleavage cut down to your belly button. <laughs> nope. At least not in my world. Oh, well. I, I, I'd say I'd need more neighbors that look like that, but I don't, I'm not a babysitter, so... No. Even though I probably have a lot of stuff in this house that a kid would love. Yeah, probably, <laughs> my, yes. my house just looks like this, my store. Yeah. <laughs> just comic book stuff everywhere. Yep, and toys. And toys. And toys. And statues. Oh, that, I couldn't take care of a kid. I got too many breakables. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that nerd guy. <laughs> yeah, kid Over. in a straight jacket. <laughs> there you go. Sit, don't look, don't touch. <laughs> yeah, that never works. No, no, not at all. So, yeah, at least the, the kid uh, comes out fine. Mom collects him and I mean, we never see those guys again after that no no it was just kind of an, uh, um, a, it was a comedy moment it was a comedy moment and I think that it was there to show that he was he was a good father yes I, I think there's more to show his character and to give you a little bit more on the on, uh, uh, sort of the, the goings on at the house and doesn't the um, this isn't this sort of the first time we sort of see that there's a, that there's uh, there's a portal I mean aside from the, the, the closet door mm-hmm. that there, that the whole house is kind of a portal uh, isn't there sort of this? I can't really. Sorry. I, I, well, I think we're, as we move along, like, I think that's almost established right away with the closet. Yeah. That big ass creature that was in the closet, but it's sometimes the closet and sometimes isn't. The mirror and sometimes, the mirror. It's, 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 sometimes it's the door under the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. And we we did kind of gloss and over. And the elves in the, in the chimney. Yeah. Yeah. That all... tried to drag the kid up there. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. yeah there's, that, that, that's, that was what I was thinking of there. We did forget to mention the, the whole interaction with the police. Because oh, that, right. that was before before he was burying the body. Yes. Because he, because yeah, that well, because Harold the, heard the yeah, gunshots. Yeah, and that was right after S- Sandy Monster is defeated, and it turns back into the his wife. So we still don't panics. know. Like, yeah, yeah. This is where he's panicking. He he's thinks like, he's killed his wife, yeah. and he kind of throws her in this storage area underneath the stairs. Yeah, underneath the stairs, while the cops come to investigate because Harold saw him out. In, in front of the house, but he could, he could only see Roger because the bushes were obscuring his view, so he just saw Roger with a gun and thinking suicide. Yes. Yeah. Attempt. Um, again, a, he's a pretty concerned neighbor. Like he, mm-hmm. he's, he's not a bad guy, but he's definitely maybe a little overly interested in his neighbor, but, but at the same time, it's, it's with good intent. Yeah. So the cops kind of come to investigate the call. He's out there, and he pretends he's polishing his gun. And... They're like, well, you do know this discharging a weapon is is illegal, so we're going to have to give you a citation. So he's kind of relieved he's getting a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> and then... They find out who he is, and yeah. they get more interested than they should. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh, you're that Roger Cobb. Do you mind if we come in? There's very presumptuous of them, actually. I mean, they're cops, and I mean, they're, they're, they're supposed to investigate. Yeah, them. well, initially, they're like, oh, you that guy. I'm like, oh, and, and he's thinking they're going to ask for an autograph, and then the partner's like, uh, can I use your washroom? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a little underwhelming, I guess, but at the but, same time, the bathroom's awfully close to the closet he just stuffed a body into. That's, that he, at this point, thinks may, may be his wife's body. Yeah. All right, so he's he's sweating bullets, and I'm almost quite literally. I mean, mm-hmm. there's, there, he's and this just again shows how talented William Cat is, is because he plays this nervousness really, really well. Yeah. Right? 
everybody's watching can tell that there's something off. Yeah, right? the, I think like, yeah, I think the one cop's like thinking uh, his behavior is a little weird, but you know, two cops just caught him with a gun, mm-hmm. so he's probably just nervous. Whereas Harold, the neighbor, is thinking something even more is off than usual. Yeah, because he's he, he's had interactions with with him before the, the, he started seeing things, right? Yeah, and he's already told Harold that he's having experiences in the house. Yeah, right. Yeah. So Harold's aware that Roger's not having a normal experience, whether it be in his own head or. And that's what Harold thinks is that Roger's kind of starting to lose his, lose his marbles. Yeah, right? right. But then, then this feeds into what Roger makes Harold sit through <laughs> after, after he's done with the babysitting. Poor Harold. <laughs> um, I, I, I love the reveal when, when Harold first sees the monsters. He just... Oh, he's just kind of so inept when he finally sees it. Like they, they want to try to reel it out. They've got it, this harpoon gun with the rope, and oh, uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that the big where like where where he, Roger gives Harold the goggles. Says you might want to wear these. Yeah, and and you would think you would start getting more and more nervous. Like, what kind of how big is this raccoon again? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I bet you needed a harpoon gun. A harpoon, yeah, with with with, with, a, with protective a, a, eyewear, a protective eyewear, and all these cameras. Yeah, it, something's not adding up this, here. This isn't a vac- raccoon, is it? <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, it, it was great that reveal where, where Harold sees the, occup- the the other occupants of the house for the first time. Right? Yeah, and his reaction um, when Roger gets. Dragged down, drugged, dragged down the wormhole. Yeah, and and uh, and, and the ro- rope ran, runs out. He fails to grab it, yeah. and <laughs> he just gets himself shit ass drunk. Yeah, he gets himself so drunk when he comes back out, he is just liquored up. Yeah, and <laughs> you know what? That's a pretty human reaction. Well, I wonder what else can you do? Yeah. You, this is something kind of uh, you can't even ra- really wrap your brain around it. It's can't... a closet. Now it's not a closet. Now it's a closet again. Well. The, my my friend slash neighbor just went through the closet and but got drug in there by a giant monster and the I'm stuck in this haunted house and I'm gonna get wasted <laughs> because yeah there's, there's, I can't call the cops and say can you help me find my friend he went down the wormhole yeah <laughs> no it's just, it's not a thing it's not a thing so yeah he <laughs> he did the only thing that was uh, that was available to him and he'd brought the booze along with him because he was expecting sort of a buddy night playing cards right yeah he got lied to yeah. <laughs> Which he deserved. He did kind of deserve. He's being a, I didn't feel bad that I, I Roger almost, lied to I, him. I almost felt like Roger was using him as bait. <laughs> but then, then Roger became the bait. So. Yeah, but I mean, almost, but Roger's, it wasn't part of Roger's character, right? No, no. Right. He just, he, need, he knew he needed a hand and just needed to wrap a story around it to make it somewhat plausible. Because how do you explain that? And well, he already tried, and, and Harold didn't buy it. Yeah, right. So he so he came up with a, a plausible explanation. Yes, for a it. horror writer's telling you about horrible things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is this sounds great for your next book, or is this just how you write? Yeah. <laughs> like or, you're just are, insane, or, or are you starting to believe your own shit? Yeah, because right? he'd already had to dealt with the the, the uh, crazy ants yeah. when when she was his neighbor. So maybe it just roles in the family yeah and <laughs> and that's part of why he called his ex-wife too is because it's like i think he's losing his mind yeah right? no there's there's some <laughs> that was that was actually really good but and this all culminates into a a final battle with big ben in a more monstrous form as he reveals that he's the one that's been toying with him this whole time he's the one that took his son and yeah. and he's 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 going to exact revenge on roger for leaving him yeah, and, um, and leaving him alive. Yeah, and part of that starts in this kind of real but not real Vietnam world where the kid's actually being is in a cage of made of bamboo. And yeah, it it's meant to feel like like Vietnam. Yes, Rogers rescuing his son and trying to escape all this. And there's a lot of chases. It's it's kind of weird seeing a monster with a machine gun, you know. It is, but it, but it was in character, right? <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is in character. I don't know. It just it it that kind of thing pops me out a bit. <laughs> like the creatures kept getting the gun. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Aren't you aren't you guys already vicious all by yourselves? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I see where you're going with that. I I didn't find that it popped me out so much because it 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 did fit in with 
the whole story, right? Uh, yeah, right. It, it, is, it absolutely supports the story. Yeah. I just, uh, I guess the preconceptions of uh, how I feel about monsters, I just, they don't need that kind of thing. They, but, they, they, they're a power within their own right, and they yeah. don't need... But Big guns. Ben is still being Big Ben at the yeah. end of the day. He just looks scarier. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a, this flashback scene where he, he talks about how much he loves his gun. Yeah. Right? I, at one point, the house kind of all moves, doesn't it? Like, he opens the door, and there's a cliff, right? Yeah. <laughs> Going straight down into to Whitewater Rapids, and... Yeah. Like, what, what is going on? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that it's meant to talk to where, that this house is on some sort of nexus. Yeah, I would, and I would have loved more explanation as to why things worked the way they worked, but it, I, it wasn't necessary either. No, it wasn't necessary, but it certainly would have been a little bit more fun, but... There really wasn't a lot of a lot of opportunity in in the story to fit that in. Yeah, right? um, unless you had more of, of of his aunt coming in and saying, "This is what I figured out in my forty years here." Yeah, right. I don't know. Maybe going through these portals and things and and things shifting, I, I'd maybe take a Silent Hill stance on it. I like when the sirens go off and then everything changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that, that that's an actually that was a great device and a not great movie. Um, yeah, well, the, it, that was just straight out of the video game yeah. that did it way better than the movie did. But yeah, no, something like that would have been would have been interesting. interesting. I mean, the, these are the things that you can sort of fill out in a remake, right? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe we should start talking about that. <laughs> um, yeah, not a bad idea. I think we've already sort of started talking about how about it a little bit as to sort of what we would do in terms of keeping it sort of a retro feel kind of yeah film. we can keep we can keep the Vietnam tropes uh, I mean you can certain we we like we said we could, you could bring it up to Desert Storm or whatever yeah, and- more modern military thing uh, and it all still kind of work. You, you might have to change, tweak things here and there. Maybe with the kids not in bamboo anymore or whatever. But uh, I think both of us agreed to keep this one in the 80s. Yeah, it does mess up my casting because I, I had kind of well, cast with a modern feel. Well, what what did you have tonally? What did you think? Were I, you I, was, I was thinking originally sort of something a little more modern. Okay. Um, so that did impact my casting because I... I, I Deliberately, I, I deliberately avoided some some of the the staying with the same characters and character types in, in mm-hmm. the movie, to, in order to modernize it. I mean, and maybe that's just my childhood love that I wanted to keep in the eighties. It's that's kind of rare for me. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're, you are, you do tend to, to want to sort of go more modern, and and I less, do less, like but. well, I a lot of the times I want to go modern, but because I can change things yeah. a lot, and mm-hmm. I'm of the mind why remake something and keep it the same. Yeah. And that's and that was part of what where I was going when I went to, was looking at my casting is is well with because of the nature of this movie I don't have to play like none of these characters have to remain exactly the same yeah they don't even have to be the same people yes at the end of the day at the end of the day and actually my casting kind of plays into that a little bit mm-hmm. yeah it was weird I was kind of rejecting some my some of my um, I guess they could be tropes at this point. Some of my bad habits of, of like, okay, well, this worked this way. Let's turn it into a gore fest. And at one point, I wanted to this be directed by Fetty Alvarez and let's go the Evil Dead remake route yeah. with this thing. And I'm like, no, I kind of want to keep it a horror comedy. This, this subject matter kind of requires horror comedy almost. It's, yeah. Because um, it is batshit crazy. It is batshit crazy and you could have so much more fun with it with the, with the right writer like, I, I'd, I'd really play up some of the more, the more comedic elements and yeah I did I'm like well because I didn't feel like the comedy was landing the way it should no there were a f- few that worked really well and a few that just didn't they, they, that you could tell it was supposed to be funny but kind of fell flat yeah in the 80s though I found it much funnier so it might have a lot to do with my expectations from a horror comedy now because mm-hmm. horror comedies have gotten a lot funnier yeah yeah that's um, true a lot more comedy and a lot less well, a lot of comedy combined with a lot of gore. Yeah, there's there's a, a better balance uh, handled, and uh, it did feel like it was trying to be serious even in the comedic moments. Exactly, yeah. The comedy was supposed to be understated, and again, sometimes it worked and sometimes it yeah, didn't. Yeah, that might have been an editing thing, or maybe Henry Manfredi's Manfredi, music. I'm, I know I'm butchering the name. He was he was the uh, guy who scored the uh, original Friday Thirteenth movie. Also scored this, and sometimes it felt more like a Friday Thirteenth score when I was listening to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 let's talk about the music just briefly. Yeah, yeah. I, I found the music actually quite invasive. 
Yeah, and um, maybe that's what's happening. It's it's sometimes changing the tone from where it should be. Yeah, the lighter tones in the music. It was all very ominous and, mm-hmm. and very eighties horror music. Right, so that that may have been part of why a lot of stuff fell flatter than maybe it should have. Yeah, it, it might have not been the scene itself, just how how it was edited and how, where the music was placed, and and nothing seems to support and uplift those comedic moments. That's right. Yeah, yeah, they they feel like they're more suppressed than they should be. Yeah, they do. But yeah, so when I when I was casting. Last night, I, I was thinking more modern, but as, of course, we were talking, going a little more retro, going, going retro would work really well as well. When we get to casting, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I chose Cathy. We are in casting. We are in casting. <laughs> well, let me get my list. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was trying to break some, some of my bad habits as well and stop trying to cast to the character, like, tr- trying to cast to the, to the actor who was already playing the role, because that kind of... Oh, I, that was so hard because I had like the perfect replacement for William Cat, and I'm like, I'm not going there because it's it's too on the nose. Exactly, and, and that, <laughs> that was the thing. Is and you know we are we we've talked about before about whitewashing and stuff like that, and when we don't need to cast white actors and everything, but it's so easy to fall into that trap when you're doing a remake because that's what you've seen already. So I made, I made a conscious effort to not do that this time, which... Yeah, I mean, I, I often cast uh, with a more ethnic thing in mind, but this one, it's such a small cast, I just didn't see any particular place, oh, I, I, especially in like kind of a rural white neighborhood that it's in. Well, and that's why if I went, with, that's why when I was thinking more modern, mm-hmm. you would see that type of interracial thing ideally, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's why I went with an actor that I genuinely love. I'm watching every time I see him, I'm, I really like Common. Great I actor, do too. and I, th- I think he'd, he'd he'd play that sort of ex soldier and writer character very very well. Oh, I, I wish I would have thought that direction actually, because I was thinking. A tall guy, um, and I, I, my mind went in a, uh, to a specific actor from a specific movie that um, still has a kind of a tall, burly presence, but uh, I, you can't find anybody like Richard Mull because he's like no. seven feet tall. Well, well yeah, and, and I, but I've cast Common as my Roger. Oh, he's your Roger. Yeah. Uh, he'd be a good Roger too. Yeah, because I mean, because yeah. he's, got, he's got that. Like he said, you could see him as an, as an ex soldier, but you yeah. can also he's, he's so eloquent when he speaks that you could see him as the writer as well. Right? Yeah, you're right. Then I went for for Harold. I just went with George Wind again. <laughs> yeah, he's still around. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Give right? him a second shot at it. Yeah, <laughs> why not? I, got, I was I was thinking like I, I was going to do Kevin James. You can play that type of character as well. But I'm like, no, you know what? I like George. Okay, well, yeah, you, you see, you can see yours still lends itself well to the horror comedy so far. Yeah, exactly. Um, for Big Ben, I actually went way off in a completely different direction. Um, I've got multiracial and non-gender specific. I went with Michelle, Michelle Rodriguez because she can play that badass really, really well. Well, it would play, that would play more to your modern That's sensibility because right. there certainly weren't wouldn't have female the, soldiers in Vietnam. Yeah. But modern, absolutely. Yeah. So and I, that's because I, I, I got hung up. Right. I was like, mm. who would bring that kind of presence that Richard Mole would? Aside from Common, who I'd already cast in a, in, in a different role. Mm. My, I did come across her. I just didn't know where to put her. I'm like, oh, and yeah. that. Yeah. If I would have been thinking of modernizing like I would normally do, yeah. I, I totally would have went there. Yeah, because yeah, you can't replace Richard Mole in terms of presence in, in, in this particular role. No, that thinking. would make significant changes in in that dynamic as well. I yeah. really dig that. That could have been even a kind of side romance on in the squad. Yeah, exactly. Where they, they were they were they were attracted to each other, and but they were kind of holding off because of the rules and all and, that. Well, stuff, and right? you can change the motivations instead of like I'm in pain, put me out of my misery kind of moment. Yeah. You, it's like you, I, I love you, why are you leaving me behind kind of moment, right? Yeah. Right? It could it could get really intense actually. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. So and for Sandy, I actually I'm changing Sandy Sinclair's name by the way, mm-hmm. um, to another alliterative name. I'm casting Lucy Liu as Lucy Liu, <laughs> as Roger's wife. Nice. I thought, cause, because I, yeah. I've seen, I, I believe they've actually worked together before, and I, but I don't know for sure. Now, this is where I kind of fell apart a little bit, because I just realized that I just wanted Kathy Bates as, the, as, as, as Aunt Elizabeth. Okay. <laughs> um, but having Common as, his, as, her, as his, her nephew, it'd be like a step nephew or or yeah. adoptive nephew or something like that. But I just love Kathy Bates and we see her we use her a lot on and the show. Sure, why not? But um Yeah, I used her recently. Yeah. But I mean she could do the the, the crazy Anne and you could really fill out her story a little with a little mm-hmm. bit and use her better. 
So I, and that's really all my casting because those are really the, the five central characters of the movie. I didn't cast the Tanya because any pretty Hollywood actress would do. Yeah. And then for my director, because I really enjoyed Knock Knock, I wanted to see what he'd do with this type of genre, this sort of horror comedy. So I went with Eli Roth. Okay. <laughs> I know you hate Eli Roth, but... but <laughs> I don't hate him as a person. I actually like hearing him talk about movies and stuff. I just don't like his. Yeah. So... Uh, I, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm with you for the most part, like I said, but having... And I, that's why I specific, specifically mentioned the one that I did see, which was really a departure from what I've seen from him in the past. Right. So I'd like to see him depart a little bit more. Okay. Well, my fantasy casting was driven more with a, a, a retro 80s thing in mind, keeping it around 1986 as far as the timeline goes. So as we said at the beginning, I was thinking more as a director, the, the Duffer Brothers. See, Specifically driven by Stranger Things and that's in my what, mind. I, I, they were on my list as well, but I'm like, I already yeah. used them. And, and I haven't. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, but, you know, I did also have my alternative splatter gore in, in Fetty Alvarez. So yeah. I just, uh, I didn't cast with that in mind. So keep, in, keep that in mind. This is still a horror comedy in my casting. <laughs> so, but if I went splatter gore, Fetty Alvarez all the way. Now, for my Roger Cobb, I, I, I definitely tried something different with this cast. It's not my what my my brain would normally go. I went against a lot of instincts because <laughs> I wanted the, these guys that I think would do horror comedy, but maybe we haven't seen in these parts. Uh, some of them you may you you'll will seem familiar, but and and fit into type. But for my Roger Cobb, I went with Damian Lewis. Nice, yeah. I think back to that kind of the oh, the way he over the top played in that Stephen King movie. Um, oh, with the animals and the fucking alien poop aliens. Oh, um, <laughs> oh heck, I can't remember that movie all of a sudden. Oh, I was gonna say Sleepwalker, but that's not it. No, that was a bad movie. That was too. <laughs> so it was, it was a this TV one. movie with Jason Lee and no, 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 it wasn't a TV movie. It was a real movie. Real movie? <laughs> it's a poop alien. But no, you got the cast right. Jason Lee's in it and. It just uh, it was an actual theatrical, so. But um, I'm blanking, so doesn't doesn't matter. But he was really over the top and crazy in that, and, I, and I'm like, well, you know, I, I think he can do comedy, and we've already seen him in Band of Brothers as far as a soldier. So I'm like, you know, I think he kind of works yeah. for me, and. I did for his Sandy Sinclair. I, I wanted just slightly younger than him. He's mid forties, and that's okay. There can be a little distance between your husband and wife. I wanted Malin Ackerman. Okay. I wanted somebody pretty and attractive because she's want that Hollywood starlet look, but still a capable actress and and has done already done a horror comedy. Yes. So, yeah, she she fit fit in there quite nicely. Now Harold, I went with. And and sometimes this guy bugs the shit out of me, but I went with Seth Rogen as the shitty neighbor. <laughs> you know, uh, he's a good he's a good choice. Yeah, he's a good choice. I can see him being playing that a little more annoying neighbor. Yeah, because because Roger is keeps keeps trying to get away from him uh, for a good portion of the film until until he thinks that Harold might be useful. Yeah, there is that. So, and, and yeah, Seth, Rogen. I can see Seth being more intrusive, just being Seth Rogen, being Seth Rogen would yeah. be perfect for that spot. Yeah. For no, that I role. Agree. Yeah. For, uh, Tanya, I went with, uh, the hot starlet at the moment that looks great in tight things. Margie, Margot Robbie. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a small scene, but, it's, uh, she, she's going to kill it in, in those scenes. So, and it would be a lot of fun. And they're important scenes. They are important scenes. And speaking of important scenes, Aunt Elizabeth, despite not getting a lot of screen time, and I think that's something we could certainly pad out, yeah. give a little more uh, scenes. She gets some flashback scenes as well as her death scene and a ghost scene. And maybe we can um, show a little bit more of that in the intro with uh, with her in the house before, and see what leads up to her death. And I went with somebody who could do serious as well as funny and uh, I think she's an awesome, classy lady, Helen Mirren. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Helen Mirren would be a good choice, yeah. Yeah. Now, my Big Ben, I went with uh, Neil McDonough. He was in in Captain America, the the first Avenger. He was Dum Dum Dugan. Okay. Now I know what you're talking yeah. about, yes. Yeah. So that's kind of where that... And I think he was actually in Band of Brothers, now that I think about it. 
He's been around for a while. I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, and yeah. He's he's a very he's big, cur- imposing actor. Yeah, yeah, and he's currently on Arrow. And anybody's seen him, he's like, just he seems to be getting bigger, more barrel chested all the time. Yeah. I'm like, that dude's been working out. Yeah. <laughs> so and and he's been the bad guy before. So, yeah. So like he's been a good guy. He's been a bad guy. So yeah, you know, I, I it'd be a little different than Richard Mull, but at the same time, uh, I think he could pull it off. I don't know how good he'd look under makeup, but at the same time, we have CG. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter yet. I, I, I mean, if we're going retro, I'd almost like to do more, uh, try and keep it as practical as possible. I, yeah, I prefer practical and even makeup effects. Practical makeup effects have come a long way as well. That's right. And the animatronics, because there's some movement in, in Richard Mull's face uh, under that makeup as well, and that's animatronic movement. And that's come a long way, too. Just look what they're doing on Walking Dead right now. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like they're doing movie quality practical effects. Yeah, with the budget they have for that show because it's making so much money. Yeah. There's a reason for that it looks so, so good. Yeah, true enough. True enough. Okay, well, let's uh, we can hit uh, maybe some uh, things that need to be tweaked plot-wise as well here. Um, I mean, it doesn't really need a lot of tweaking. There's some stuff that's, uh, that may be missing. Like I said, we were ta- we talked about sort of maybe a little more about the story on, on the house itself. Yeah, well, I think some of the, the characters that feel throwaway, like Sandy, maybe we need to see her play more in some of the flashbacks of them together. Yeah, I, I think so- showing them how, how, like, inten- how intensely in love they are before their, so their yeah. disappearance. Yeah, I and despite that them being split up there doesn't seem to be any tension they're between very them. friendly actually yeah and they there's there's a lot of concern on sandy's part for roger's welfare yeah it's almost like she wasn't hit near as hard as he was which maybe you can change i think there i think maybe a restrained love <laughs> from afar like she should be hurt too we should see her pain as well we, uh, to a, yeah, she needs to be so, yeah. a character yeah instead of some actress that shows up uh, in, in the final final moments of the film yeah really yeah you're right and, so, and then, like these flashbacks show her a little bit more show how like what a happy family they are yeah. Right? Yeah. Instead of those moments, I mean, that disappearance moment, but you should see some of those memories at, at the beginning of the movie, before he moves to the house, some of those happier memories and what leads up to the disappearance. Because we really only see the disappearance and we just see that family unit for a brief moment. Yes. And we never see it again. So you, to be more emotionally drawn into what's happening with those two characters we need to see more of it yeah i agree yeah and uh, there'd be an opportunity there for as well to sort of sneak in some more scenes with aunt elizabeth yeah right? absolutely um where she talks about her experiences in the house right? yeah she's, she's trying to to let roger know that the house he grew up in isn't what he thinks it is mm-hmm. right? and certainly the there could be more ghost scenes with Aunt Elizabeth where she explains what she discovered about the house to sort of fill out the, what the house is. Right. Because she's been there for 40 plus years and she knows, right? She's, she, she'll have figured shit out. It's just a matter of making sure that she has an opportunity to explain to him or she, or, or she just tells him. It's like, you know, I, I've, I've, I've got a journal that explains everything about the house. It's underneath the dresser um, or taped at the bottom of the dresser in, 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 in my bedroom or whatever, right? Um, mm-hmm. Just something to, to give the sto- the, uh, more backstory on the house itself. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that as well and how it was personally traumatizing her. Yes. Or how it was getting her because what's driving its revenge on, on Roger isn't necessarily the spirits that are fucking with her. That's right. And that's exactly like right. what what is, what is her skeleton in the closet? What is why is it specifically targeting her at that time? At that time, and why why and why didn't it bother Roger when he was living there as a child? Yeah, right. So there because it's it the house has motive. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that's, kid, kidnapping his son is is definitely the motive of one person. And that that's Big Ben. Yeah, yeah, and, male or female. Yeah, exactly. and it's a shitty thing to do. Yeah. So, so that and that's interesting. The thing too is, it, it not only is the house an active hotspot for portal or or spirits or whatever you want to call it, it has motive, mm-hmm. right? which is really interesting, actually. Right? Yeah, because it's an inanimate object that has a, has a driving force. Yeah, right? and maybe we should change the the scene with the cops a bit because they do. Earlier in the film, he's on the phone and he's he's talking to some investigator about his case. 
and they're going, don't worry, we'll call you when we have something. Yes. Like, I get the feeling this has been an ongoing thing. So wouldn't the cops know him more for that than being fanboys? Because it's they've been dealing with this case for God knows how long, and him calling constantly about it and and seeing where they are, wouldn't the peop- the cops from this town be aware of that? They would have been aware of the disappearance, but they wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be aware of him as, as, as the Roger Cobb, right? Right. Until he tells them who he is, right? They, yeah, but they, even... They that, know the, the house. The house, the call to the house, and... Yeah, well, because he's calling a specific officer. I guess, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess this, uh, your standard patrolman may not have. Uh, generally speaking, though, um, cops run beats, so it they, well, they be. would have been aware of the occurrence, but I don't know if they'd have the intimate details, right? Yeah, it's, it, but depending on how it, long they've been on that patrol. But it does need to be acknowledged as part of the di- the, the dynamic between them that they would, yeah, at the that, very least aware of that could change some of the tension in that scene as yes. well. Yeah, because now they're going. Oh, great! This guy's. We, we we know that this guy's kind of obsessive about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe going. take it because they never acknowledge it as a suicide call, which is what Harold called it. Yeah, that's right too. So right. you know, maybe they should be asking about his uh, questions about his mental well being and and testing him in that regard. In, instead of turning into sort of uh, like yeah, I don't want to say fanboys, but but sort of yeah. more like celebrity. And that could change the tension within the scene. Yeah. yeah, it would certainly change the tension of the scene. Yeah. yeah. Definitely something needs to change there because it, it's an awkward scene. I, it was one of the more awkward scenes in the movie, and not because of the tension, like what's happening with with Roger, but just because it didn't really flow very well. You're right. It, there's something needed to change in there. Yeah, yeah. With the shotgun shells, there was all that that great foreshadowing that was kind of wasted. Yeah, yeah. It just it it doesn't play as well as it should, and and sometimes just it's foreshadowing that doesn't go anywhere yeah it was it was it, it didn't re it was kind of anticlimactic foreshadowing yeah right he drops the shotgun shells so a cop can find them woot woot right? yeah um, like yeah maybe he gets out of that scene but and they're left on the table but now they're on the table when he's shooting things hey he's now backed up in the kitchen and there's some shotgun shells so. yeah um and maybe instead of the device with the grenade those shotgun sh- shells play into the end end of the movie as well right? yeah they become a device rather than like a, like, a, like a, an actual part of the story instead of just a instead of a to, gag. Yeah, instead of a gag. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because I mean, yeah, those shotgun shells could have could play very well into it. Right? Yeah. Through an, imp- an improvised explosive device or something. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, just getting getting him out of some sort of jam temporarily to survive, to get to the next room or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, so, so it's, that would help fix that scene and provide more to the foreshadowing that 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 was really blatant there. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Okay, and now perfect timing. Guess who just walked in the door from Highlander training? <laughs> exactly. Trish Coughlin, you hey, fought, you actually made it in the final moments of the battle with, <laughs> with the house here, and um, I'm glad you made it because you were really looking forward to, to talking about yeah. this, but, you know, we're in, the, we're in remake territory now, so... Yep. Let's. I, I since, since uh, we're in the final moment, let's, let's hear what your cast was for this film and your ideas here. Yeah, well, I mean, I was with you. Like we were, you. I know you kind of brought me up to speed. So I keep it with in the eighties with the Vietnam War, and I think that's perfect. So with my casting, I didn't do it like a completely white cast because I'm like, think of Vietnam. That there was a lot of African Americans that were fighting in that war. Yeah. So yeah, why go there? Yeah. But I also went a little older in age. I didn't go very young. Yeah, mine were a little older. I mean, you got to think some time has passed from the war, right? as these guys are veterans and um sam had similar ideas he just kept had it a more modern take on it and Mm. i think it was really it's really it's a good one where you can change some fundamental things about it and uh i certainly like like michelle rodriguez in there and and that really changes uh the motivations of of ben uh, or whatever you want to call her at that point she could still be ben yeah she could still be ben it could be a nickname right yeah because <laughs> she's big, yeah. Justin, maybe I don't know. Well, uh, no. She's kind of diminutive. Actually, she's not a very big woman. So it's ironic. Yeah, it's yeah. ironic. Benjamina. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I really like that aspect and, mm-hmm. and and the way that changes the story and the motivations behind what she's doing. Because yeah. you know she's been killed by the enemy. 
isn't going to have a life mm. with the person that she she loved from that point in time who had oh, a yeah. child with some some actress. Yeah, so yeah. This unreciproc- unreciprocated love. Yeah, so happened. taking taking that thing from him and her chance to be a parent as well. Like that that whole thing changes mm. in in really great fantastic ways. The dynamic of the final battle is yeah. completely changed which in in like an awesome way. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's and that was kind of what I was thinking when I went, when I decided to go with a with, with a, a, a female in that role because it, it did change the dynamics so dramatically. And I think it would mm-hmm. change also too, like having the child on that other side, uh, having them closer. Like it would be more. I don't think it would be like a child just in a cage in the middle of nowhere. I think it would be like she would be taking it. Yeah, yeah. As a parent to this child, so it would become. I think it would be completely different when he came over there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, that, that that's a really good way to go, and I'm, I'm kind of jealous that I, you know, I, I, I think uh, I got stuck in that, my childhood there for a moment in, in mm. my casting. I'm still happy with my casting. Though. But yeah, but it, I mean, you were talking like it's a Stranger Things type thing. If you want, mm. like, if you just capture that magic that is so 80s, mm-hmm. you think it would be great, and then, like, make it so 80s funny. Yeah, I mean, with the those the duffers and their modern sensibility towards capturing everything that weight made the '80s work, mm-hmm. I'm like I don't even think when they did it in the '80s they caught it as well as as the duffers did it. So, and Sam and I were talking about maybe the failures of where some of the comedy falls flat, and that could mm-hmm. be down to editing and tone. Um, we think the music had some things to do with that as well. And I think it's also too. It's also because of some of the '80s comedy. Some of it's kind of a little bit slapstick at the time. Not all of it ages quite as well as you remember. Yeah, it. yeah, that's true. The comedy doesn't age, as, yeah, and and some of the effects don't age that well yeah. in this movie. But yeah, but gooey, gooey Ben. That I think that still worked. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, it did. Okay, so what do you got? All right, so for my lead, uh, the William Cat character, I have Don Cheadle. Very good. Because I I see him as like, I can see him in so many roles. He can be a guy who was in Vietnam, but now he's a writer Mm -hmm. and he's at the house. And And he's really, he's got a good gift for the gab. So it's true. And he he can carry the humor that we need in this movie. He totally can. Yeah. I I was thinking of of him in Boogie Nights, actually. Um, That, Mm -hmm. that the comedy, the comedy without intention, intentionally being comedic. Yeah. I really like that. And Mm -hmm. he was such a sweet character in that movie. Loved it. Warmed my heart. Um, and for uh, Ben, I have Keith David. Oh, nice. I was like, he's well, an older guy. And I kind of saw him as... But the voice. Yes, the voice, yeah. Especially and, uh, especially under whatever the special effects would look like. Oh, you would know it's Keith David. Yeah. And that's a great thing. But I also saw him as he would... He had been in the army like before Don Cheadle got there. And it was mm. more of a mentoring relationship, which is why he's really mad that he left him. Yeah, well, he wouldn't be uh, at that point. Well, you could actually change, that would change, the, again, the story nicely. What, what if he was the one in command instead of having this, the this smarmy. anti-establishment, smarmy bullshit yeah. that's going on? What if he's the one in command and it was Roger through maybe his own nervousness or ineptness or mm-hmm. um, bad decision-making that leaves his commanding officer in in a traumatic moment or, or led to his... His uh, torture and then, demise. Well, exactly. torture and then demise. Yeah. Or he screws up. Like, he just yeah. screwed up. He did the wrong thing at the wrong time. And so now it's become almost a personal trauma that he's embarrassed by and, you know, he can't take back. And and uh, he's been maybe he's been trying to it. make up for, for that mistake ever since in, in his life and, and fix that whatever was wrong with him in the first place exactly. that made him make that decision. I, you know, that's, that's a really great angle. Yeah. Like, which is also why he's having so much trouble writing the book is because he has to acknowledge his own shame. Yeah. And what happened there. So. Yeah. It's become uh, some therapy for him. Exactly. I think the writing in the book, uh, in the movie itself, we don't see enough of the motivation behind it. Yeah. Outside mm-hmm. of just wanting to do something different. Uh, we don't see that personal nature of it. It doesn't feel, even in the flashbacks, it doesn't feel no. very personal. No, it doesn't. Yeah. And I thought it was always that part of it. Like he didn't, he, this pain, this trauma that he's dealing with. I always thought that was, I mean, besides losing their child, that was part of why their marriage was breaking down at the same time. Yeah. Is he just wouldn't communicate and 
the, the ch- losing the child was kind of the final. Yeah, and we talked about that definitely needs to change between him and Sandy is that they seem to have an awfully good relationship for being divorced and having a child go missing. I know, right? <laughs> so we definitely need, that definitely needed to change. And a mystery missing where they talk about like something magical should have happened and he's insisting on it. Like, wouldn't you think that he's crazy and be really mad at him? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, we do see her when he does drive by the house and her reaction to it. So this is obviously something that's been a problem mm-hmm. with the, between them before. But uh, we just don't get enough of it on camera. No, exactly. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, this movie... I mean, there's not a lot you could cut out, so you'd have to be very, very judicious in what you added. Well, it's not a very long movie to begin no. with. It's 90, it's 90, 90 minutes. Yeah, show, so. so you got some room. I mean, another, another 15, 10, 10, 10 to 15 minutes, yeah. would probably be perfect to insert these these bits. Just just to add a little and, more and, dimension to it. And, the and then just shave off movie, some yeah. of the silliness that just goes, goes nowhere. Mm-hmm. And like some exposition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just some expositional dialogue can also help. Yeah. I mean, it's not nothing that requires a shit ton of time, no. but will go a long, long way. Yeah. No, awesome. Yeah, I mean, and, and even pushing it two hours isn't out of the realm. So, no, yeah, no, the, yeah, two hours. If you keep it, if you keep it light enough, and you have enough going on, like mm-hmm. more of a battle with the house. That's sort of what. Yeah, I Yeah, well, no, we wanted to see more with uh, Aunt Elizabeth as well, mm-hmm. because I, we feel like there's an entire movie there that doesn't get explained. Yeah, yeah. Jane's called the house zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dynamic, like she, she mentions that she believed the house was haunted, and so they what's sort her of... story, and what's the house been doing to her? Because whatever's dri- driving uh, Rogers is yeah. is is very personal to Roger, but the house has been tormenting her as well so what's that i mean this is obviously a portal of that's driven by torment and and bad thoughts exactly (laughs) and like maybe tie in that release because at the end he's fine but is is his aunt just going to be haunting in that house for the rest of eternity yeah maybe we should have her uh show up uh (laughs) <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi style yeah, yeah. every, every uh, now and again to help uh, being the uh, the guiding spirit, the, actually the kinder spirit in the house that is uh, trying to yeah. help Roger through this and, yeah. and maybe lead him to these uh, hints of getting her, his son back. Yeah, how, mm-hmm. how, to, how to access the portal and, and, and mm-hmm. how the portal works and all of that stuff. Right? Yeah, instead of stumbling mm-hmm. across it. Yeah, like when the, like the figuring out that it, that it opens at midnight. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like yeah, just you have to throw it through the medicine cabinet to get in there. Yeah. And FYI, learning from this movie, um, if you have a really long bit of rope, how to properly put it together so that it'll unravel properly when it goes down into the hole. Because I looked at that and I'm like, that is very useful to know. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> if you didn't have. Although that. he probably should have dropped some toothpaste or something in the hole to see how <laughs> how far down it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, didn't he do that with shaving cream or something when he was first testing to see if it would go through and hit? Oh, I guess he kind of was. It just wasn't of that motivation at the time. Yeah, no. Cool. Okay, sorry, continue. Okay, and his wife is going to be Vanessa Williams. Oh, that's interesting. (laughs) She she strikes me as a gorgeous soap opera actress. Yeah. And I, I believe, like, the child was taken a long time ago. So, like, they had the kid a while ago. And, and yeah, like, I think that's... And she can also do comedy as well. She yes. was on Ugly Betty, and I really loved her in that. Yeah, no, I, I, that's an interesting choice. And, you know, there was something we started the podcast and commenting on, on uh, how a lot of TV actors were in this movie. And yeah. she's probably done more television than she has film, although, you know, she's definitely done some of that as well. Eraser. Yes. yes. Yeah. Was it, where was Eraser filmed? It was like around, it was in Vancouver, was it? Oh, I don't know. Lots there? of things in Vancouver. I remember, yeah, because I remember that because I remember recognizing buildings in Eraser. It was dumb. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> yeah, I love watching movies in cities that I know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, and for their, their child, I went a different way and oh, I, I want to pronounce her name, but I'm going to get it wrong. It's She was in Wilderbeast somewhere to find them. Uh, Kovanye Wallace, I think is how you pronounce her name. <laughs> okay. Um, I want I her in there. I will correct you. It's, it's nice that somebody else is struggling with a name <laughs> yeah, for a change. Go. This well, makes me everybody happy. Everybody did. There was like an entire award season where nobody knew how to pronounce her name. <laughs> Just you probably did uh, better than John Travolta would have. So John Travolta couldn't pronounce much. <laughs> I don't know what he was on at that whole ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> I think he'd started drinking like he'd pre-drunk well into that. 
He must have. I don't know. <laughs> he was just like, this name isn't working. You you are now this person. <laughs> yes. Exactly. I, you know, this will be your new stage name because the other one's not working. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> exactly. And for their neighbor. I dub thee. <laughs> I dub thee. This is, yeah, you can't, John Travolta, you can't just keep renaming people. <laughs> <laughs> she should have just sung let it go let it go because she's the one who sang let it go yeah. that's right <laughs> just in his face don't even try john let it go <laughs> i'll do my own intros from now on that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> awesome and for their neighbor i just kept george went george went yeah so did sam <laughs> yeah i mean why not i mean he's still working he still looks exactly the freaking same mm-hmm. yeah like i mean the guy does not age i mean he's a little grayer but that's about it and I kind of want him to be like kind of the elderly older neighbor who's really nosy. Yeah, yeah. well, it would it would actually play more to the character yeah. than it did this time around. Yeah, like an, a forty year old guy that interested in your new neighbors that uh, even in the eighties, I don't even think that was normal. No, it, it that was just a comes off thing, right? Creepy. Mm-hmm. It, it was it was it was more he was, he was sort of a, a, a big fan of, a, of Roger Cobb as the writer, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and really wanted to make friends with this famous guy. Yeah, I, I get him, get the feeling he's the, the lonely neighbor that annoys everybody. That uh, that's why he has no friends. Yeah, yeah, he's got his dog. Yeah. Also, I want to boost up the, the rule of the dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what would you have for the dog do? I Poop on the, his yard? No, I want the <laughs> I want the dog to save someone at some point. Maybe have the dog grab onto the rope at some point when somebody's getting pulled into the portal. I kind of want, I just want the dog to be part of it. I think it would be hilarious if it was, if it was a lap dog and it just got drug in. <laughs> yeah. That would be actually kind of funny. Oh, or cool, like it was, it's a lap and it dog. it comes back as a giant monster. Ooh, or the lap dog, it, it's a lap dog, but he also has a cat. And they kind of, they have a loving relationship, but sort of torment each other. And the cat helps sort of save a the dog. A adver- adversarial. Adversarial one. <laughs> and like the cat at one point, like kind of, kind of helps a save the dog. A story of Homeward Bound in the, a ghost house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we'll expand the animals in this movie. That's what's going to happen now. <laughs> <laughs> and and there, were, there actually was a raccoon in the closet, <laughs> ironically. Yeah, exactly. Which turned into a giant monster. And then the cat and the dog like attack it together. Yeah. There's a whole, I think there's a whole other movie here now. I'm not sure what's going on anymore. There's a whole different, there really is a whole different movie. Sorry. I, I'm big on animals. I, yeah, I recently watched some animal movies. Anyway. And for um, the aunt, I have Lynn Shay, who is in Insidious. Because I remember we were, I was trying to figure out. I, kept the, I keep saying sinister, and I mean Insidious every time. These, those movies are getting interchangeable at this point. Exactly. That is starting to change a little bit. But yes, so Lynn Shay would be very good in that I think part. she's the great aunt role. And I love her in a horror haunted movie i just that's that's the movies she should always be in yeah i want her to lead me to 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 portals i want her to tell me how to get through places she's gonna tell me how to do stuff and i appreciate that that is awesome (laughs) now you just came back from highlander training as i keep calling it you were doing some sort stuff what skills did you learn and how would that help you survive this house Ooh, i learned to parry and i learned to block and I also know how to, like, move around properly so that that house can't get a good hold on me. Like, if that monster came out and I had a sword in my hand, I could, like, swat and, like, cut off a couple of the hands and then like, cut off the other hand and, like, stab once it was open. And you wouldn't have to rely on, on flying shed tools. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I could totally do that. Although you would kind of be bringing a knife to a gunfight. Yeah. That is a bit of the challenge. Yeah. Although... Yeah, I don't know. We, I was complaining about the ghost kept getting the gun. <laughs> I know what happened with that. And I'm like, but the ghosts, they just, they should be. It almost feels like they become less threatening with the gun than more. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm I, like, I well, that, but... you're a pussy ghost if you need a weapon, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> but I and I did point out that that's in character with absolutely Big ben with because ben. he was he, yeah. he was a, he really did love his gun, but yes. but not monster Sandy. That didn't make a lot of sense with Monster Sandy. No, it no. didn't Monster Sandy, you're right. Yeah, Monster Sandy. But that that, that hand creeped me out for a long time. <laughs> the disembodied hand. It, when I went to the bathroom, that freaked me out because I always imagined there was a hand that somebody had flushed and it was coming back for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Like, would it, it would have been like after all this happened uh, the next day, and then the hands grabbing you at the from the pooper. <laughs> yeah. Well, like remember in Ghostbusters when Dana gets taken and then comes through the chair right right up over her crotch, 
and grabs her that way. That's how I imagine the hand would come back in the toilet. <laughs> yeah, I can't see. I imagine and that. Then but now that you haul me down through the toilet. Oh, ooh, gross. A la train spotting. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Well, sorry. <laughs> in your house, <laughs> do you do you listen to Invasion of the Remake? What, do we haunt you in your dreams? We can you can do that, of course, on iTunes, Stitcher, Audio Boom. Tell your friends where to find it. Mm-hmm. Blueberry, Player FM, Player FM, absolutely. Google Play Music, and yeah, tune in that, that YouTube thing. They were there too. Yeah. You could do that. But, you know, if you're listening to YouTube, that, that that's not a way to listen no. to the podcast. You're like, that's where you tr- test us out, and then you go download us on your portable devices. Yeah. So you can listen to us whenever you want, wherever you yeah. want. Yeah, or on your computer. Yeah. You know, yeah. follow us on Facebook. You you can know when the new episode drops. And uh, they're, they're always there, and we, we talk some other smack as well. Yes. <laughs> you could do that on our Facebook. It's Invasion of the Remake. And in, in, at Invasion Remake over on Twitter. And, mm-hmm. you know, we'll tell you what we're watching and we'll re- interact with you we don't have people representing us it is us you were talking and to. if they want to send us an email yes email invasion of the remake at gmail.com yes if you want to get more detailed in what yes. you want to tell if us. you want to become an official invader though write a review on itunes mm-hmm. give us a five-star rating or even you know a review on google play whatever what you, your your app of choice is uh help us out it really helps us uh rise in the charts when you do that that's what they use to kind of engage things is how how you interact with us so uh write that brief review recommend it and or tell us what we could do better as well as uh leaving that rating it helps other people find the show as well so be, and while be cool we love you guys we want more people we want more earballs more earballs listening yeah. to our beautiful voices yes that's right we need more earballs on the show the party can always get bigger exactly we're and we're like a nice invasion we invade, but it's good. Well, the invasion is all the remakes, and we're going to take that to task every single week, and then, of course, uh, be guilty of it ourselves every other week. <laughs> we will never <laughs> run out of material. No, no. Um, if, if we stop, it's because we got really tired and, and depressed about it all. <laughs> <laughs> or we're just dead. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, could, we could have died because we just uh, there's an endless supply of it. <laughs> now, this was uh, the last one for November, and we're heading into December, so so uh, we get into some holiday fun uh, at that point as well. And if you look at our list from last uh, December, mm-hmm. we came off some kooky stuff. And um, I'm hoping to find something as crazy as Santa Claus again. So <laughs> the, the one that you hated the most. Oh, I hated that. But it, it became a really fun movie to challenge. remake. It was a challenge to watch, though. <laughs> I know. And sometimes that's the way it works. Yeah. And maybe we'll do that again this time. Yeah. Or if anybody has a holiday challenge for us. <laughs> That's right. Us- Honestly, by the time they hear this, it's probably going to be too late to make recommendations because no, we know. try to get ahead so we can actually get some time off on the holidays ourselves without you missing Invasion Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Invasion goodness. Invasion goodness. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I have been Jason. I'm always Sam. And I'm Trish, usually. Trish, the Highlander. (laughs) There could be only one, but you guys are safe. (laughs) For now. (laughs) (laughs) There can be only, but it... there can be only one, but not in podcasting. The tr- Trish in- <laughs> then it's boring. Trish invaded the podcast today. I she did. She totally little- did. It she was- totally did. I'm glad she made it. <laughs> yes. All right. That's it. We're out of here. Bye-bye. died for you, Ben. Well, now's your chance.